Despite the fact this colossal ziggurat is deemed the most significant structure in the long history of the Jedi, very little is actually known about it. Who was the Jedi Temple constructed by? When was the temple formed? Why was it built in Coruscant of all places? Well, if you ever wanted to learn more about it, then look no further, my trusty Padawans, because I'm Gareth from What Culture Star Wars, and here are 10 secrets of the Jedi Temple you need to know. Number 10. The Jedi Temple debuted in The Phantom Menace In the original Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi spoke to Luke Skywalker about how the Jedi worked together to bring peace across the galaxy. 22 years later, we finally got to see the Jedi's base in Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. In this film, Obi-Wan and his master Qui-Gon Jinn bring a youngling called Anakin Skywalker to the Jedi Temple, which resides in the Galactic Republic's capital planet, Coruscant. Standing over a kilometer high and 500 meters in width, this towering structure operates as an academy since it trains younglings and padawans to use the force so they can become Jedi Knights. The temple also works as a government building since the Jedi Order sanctioned laws throughout the galaxy. Even though this sanctum is considered the official Jedi HQ, there are others on Tython, Ossus, and Dantooine. To distinguish the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, it is sometimes called the Palace of the Jedi. The Phantom Menace may have been, uh, let's say, divisive, but it was nice to finally see the Jedi's domain after it had been talked about for decades. Number 9. It was built over a Sith Shrine as long as anyone can remember, the Jedi have been purveyors of peace and prosperity. Ironically, the Jedi Temple's origins were far from pure, though. The complex in Coruscant was built over a shrine that was worshipped by the Jedi's arch enemies, the Sith. Darksiders chose this location since it lay directly above a Virgins, an energy field that amplifies force power. When the Jedi arrived on the planet and discovered this Virgins, they thought it was logical to forge their base there, since it would help them keep their force powers potent. Over the millennia, the temple expanded massively in size and divided into smaller enclaves, but the center point, the Ziggurat, still resides over this Virgins. At first, one would assume the Jedi's decision was dangerous and a little bit hypocritical. These peacekeepers wished to bring balance to the Force and yet their base is literally built on a foundation of evil. However, the Jedi figured it was more sensible for them to repurpose the shrine into a force of good rather than allow the Sith to use it to pervert the Jedi's teachings. So there you go. Number 8. The Jedi Temple was built by the Four Masters The Jedi Temple in Coruscant wasn't the first base for lightsiders. The oldest Jedi HQ was built over 5,000 years ago on the wasteland planet Osus. Not only did Force users from across the galaxy come to train there, the temple housed the Great Jedi Library, the biggest Force database in existence. It was bloody big. When the building was decimated during the Great Hyperspace War, though, a quartet of Jedi called the Four Masters salvaged the library's files, trying to protect their people's history. After the fallout of the war, they scoured the cosmos for a potential home for their people. And after they landed on Coruscant, the Masters saw a mountain peak which they believed to be the perfect location for the Jedi's permanent base. Carving a colossal ziggurat into the summit, this structure became the official temple for the light side. Although the Four Masters are responsible for building the Jedi's official temple, next to nothing is known about them. Even though they're referenced in the Clone Wars series, the Force Unleashed and appeared in statue form in Revenge of the Sith, their names remain a mystery. Number 7. There are four Jedi Councils, not one when one refers to the council that oversees everything in the Jedi Temple, many will think of Force users like Mace Windu, Kiadi Mundi, Kit Fisto, and Yoda. After all, these are the Jedi Masters we see discussing important matters like how they intend to expose the Sith Lord, or whether to train Anakin Skywalker. Yeah, they did really well on both accounts. However, this group is merely one of four different councils residing in the Jedi Temple. Yoda is in charge of a 12-membered company called the Jedi High Council, which deals with governing matters. The Council of First Knowledge oversees the archives and actively pushes Jedi wisdom. The Council of Reconciliation deals with political matters that have gotten out of hand, and the Council of Reassignment assigns jobs to young Jedi who were not accepted as Padawan. The Jedi High Council may not be the only council in the temple, but they are regarded as the primary ruling body of the Order. Even though they are an ally to the Senate, this council are given free reign and make decisions of the highest order without interference from political figures. That's an awful lot of power, I think you'll agree. Number 6. Each of the five spires are extremely important Every time there is a full shot of the Jedi Temple, there are five spires clearly visible on its peak. These columns may seem like pure decoration, but each structure serves a purpose. The central tower, Tranquility, is the tallest of the five. 
It's also the most significant since it contains the ancient text written by the founding Jedi. You know, before the whole tree thing happened. The temple spire has the most functions since it harbors a ceremonial room for newly elected Jedi, a meditation chamber, and multiple memorial statues. One of the towers serves as a chamber to discuss political matters away from the Senate, another tower is designed for training Jedi who harbor no master, and the High Council Tower is the one that Star Wars fans are familiar with since this is where the Order discuss matters that affect the Jedi way of life. Not only do the five towers serve a purpose on their own, but as a whole. This quintet are crowned with transmission antennae, which are powerful enough for the Jedi Temple to communicate to Jedi in virtually any planet in the galaxy. Number 5. 20 Jedi Abandon the Temple Two millennia after the Jedi Temple was forged, Phaneas became the first Jedi to abandon the Order. Consumed by resentment and rage, Phaneas embraced the dark side and took on the title Darth Ruin. How creative. He rallied other Darksiders to his cause and convinced 50 Jedi to join him and storm the temple, although he was defeated. The Order were left rattled, since the incident proved that respected members of the temple could be corrupted. For the next two millennia, more and more Jedi found the Order to be too stiff and dogmatic, compelling them to walk away from the temple they once swore to protect. Not all of them turned to the dark side, but Order members, especially Yoda, were disheartened to see their brethren lose faith. In the end, 20 Jedi abandoned their post in the temple, earning them the moniker The Lost 20. The last Jedi to leave the Order is also the most infamous, Count Dooku. After he realized the dark side was more in tune with his own beliefs, the once respected Jedi became Darth Sidious's disciple, Darth Tyrannus. Number 4. A Sith Nearly Killed Yoda in the Jedi Temple after Darth Sidious managed to infiltrate the Jedi Temple, it was easy for the Sith Lord to cloud the Order's ability to detect threats. As is explained in the novel Jedi Temple The Dark Rival, Palpatine corrupted Qui-Gon Jinn's Padawan Xanatos, compelling him to turn against his teachings. As Darth Xanatos fully embraced the dark side, he stole the Temple's lightsabers and sacred healing crystals. Even though the former Jedi was originally seen as a mere nuisance, Xanatos became a credible threat when he ambushed Grand Master Yoda and nearly killed him. Since Xanatos got closer to murdering the Jedi leader than anyone, the temple was no longer regarded as a safe haven and the Jedi Order were shaken to their core. Partnering up with a young Jedi called Obi-Wan Kenobi, wonder what happened to him? Qui-Gon tracked down Xanatos and retrieved the healing crystals. Over the years, Xanatos led multiple schemes to destroy the temple but was always thwarted by his former master. After suffering too many failures, Xanatos ultimately took his own life by leaping into a pool of acid. That's one way to go. Number 3. The Temple's Librarian is in Love with Count Dooku Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones debuted the Jedi Temple's database, the Jedi Archives. Composed of knowledge from all corners of space, some of which dates back millennia, the Archives are the largest library in the galaxy. When Obi-Wan Kenobi enters the facility, he speaks to the Chief Librarian, Jocasta Nu. We don't learn much about Jocasta, save that she takes her job very seriously. However, one deleted scene shows an interesting side to the elderly Jedi. The way Jocasta holds her hand on Dooku's bus shows that she had a great admiration for the Count. But according to the late actress Alethea McGrath, Jocasta and Dooku were in love in the original script. Sadly, most of this backstory was scrapped before filming and cut even further during the editing process. It's safe to say that the pair never became an official couple since the council forbid Jedi to embrace love, but it's a pity that Jocasta's origin was removed since it gave Count Dooku more depth and depicted her as a three-dimensional character rather than just a snooty librarian. Number 2. The Jedi Temple Massacre was meant to be more brutal the first five Star Wars films received a U for Universal rating, which is odd considering how violent the franchise can actually be. Even though there are scenes of Rancors eating Gamorreans, Darth Vader blowing up a damn planet, and people being ripped in half, the censor board regarded these moments as kid-friendly. However, no one was surprised when Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, became the first movie in the series to receive a PG rating. Not only does the film depict genocide, dismemberment, and a character being burned alive, Anakin Skywalker slaughters children after he storms the Jedi Temple. As brutal as the Jedi Temple Massacre is, it could have actually been much worse though. Originally, we were meant to see the gatekeeper being impaled through the skull and more graphic deaths of the Jedi. We watched the younglings being murdered in a fuzzy hologram, but we were meant to have a full scene of Anakin hacking them to pieces. It's clear George Lucas wanted this massacre to be as violent as possible, to emphasize Vader's descent into evil. But it's obvious these scenes would have been a little bit too extreme. 
Number one, George Lucas is in the Jedi Temple, kinda. Until George Lucas cameoed as Baron Papadnoida in Revenge of the Sith, the legendary filmmaker had never made an appearance in the Star Wars series. He's no Peter Jackson. At least not physically, that is. In Attack of the Clones, Obi-Wan Kenobi heads to the Jedi Temple to find details about a planetary system called Kamino. After speaking to the Archives advisor, Obi-Wan is informed Kamino doesn't exist. If you look closely in this scene, you will see the archives aligned with bus statues. These busts, which were sculpted by Richard Miller, have their likeness based on members of the Star Wars staff, including the model supervisor Brian Gernand, visual effects supervisors John Knoll and Pablo Hellman, and the animation director Rob Coleman. It goes without saying that George Lucas's face was also used for one of the statues. Although many people believe the Lucas statue is the one Obi-Wan is staring at in the beginning of the scene, this bust is actually modeled on Christopher Lee. Fancy that. The Lucas bust only appears for a few seconds, so it's easy to miss. But diehard fans still appreciated this blink and you'll miss it easter egg from the second it was unleashed onto the world. And that's our list of any other secrets of the Jedi Temple people need to know. Let me know all about them in the comment section right down below, and do not forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're at it. Also, be sure to head on over to whatculture.com and find some more incredible articles just like the one this video you're watching right now is based on. I've been Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. Thank you very much for watching this video today. May the Force be with you, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.